Proverbs chapter number two, please. The second proverb of our our study here in the book of Proverbs. As we um, as we get started here, uh, just as we're turning there, I'm reminding you that I have come. I hail from California. I am from there, and one of the things I've talked about here is the gold rush. Um, I have a friend of mine. His name is Al Deardorf, who goes out. And he was telling me that when he was younger. And when I say younger, like in his 40s and 50s, one of the issues he would have is that he would get something called gold fever. You ever heard of that, gold fever? Well, and, and I thought, I heard about gold fever, like back in the day, like, oh yeah, back then they used to get gold fever. But not nowadays. We're not so superficial as to drop everything and hide in the mountains for weeks and months on end, living off the land just to pan for a little bit of gold. But he did. And so he would go up there, and what would happen is his parents owned a, um, what they called a cabin, which was really just a trailer up there, um, like, a, like a single trailer. Not, nothing. It was, it was nice, nice little place uh, up in the mountains and uh, on the Sonora Valley in California. And by the way, which is up high. And so the Sonora Mountains, excuse me. And so anyways, when he'd go up there, uh, he'd go hang out with his parents and then he'd go fishing. And then uh, he'd say go, he's going to go out there in the afternoon and he's going to just, you know, take a pickaxe and just look for a little bit of gold while he's out there. And then he'd find something. Or maybe he wouldn't find something. It didn't matter. But he would do a little bit more. And, uh, and then he'd keep going more. And then the worst thing is if he would find just a little bit of gold, just a tiny bit of gold, he would stay out there and just keep looking and looking. And, look. and then what he would do is for weeks, he would fish and he would just live out there. He'd hunt if he needed to, sometimes not even eat. And he would just mine all day or just pan for gold out in the rivers. And that's what he would do. And he would come back with a little bit of money sometimes, sometimes a lot of money, but not much. Regardless, it's he would get gold fever. Now, this was pre-living for the Lord days um, that he was he was also addicted to a number of things during that time but uh, but anyways he'd go out there and he was willing to do the work for the sake of getting some gold that was it and uh, anyways uh, we understand it took a lot of effort it took some resources it took sacrifice and what we're going to find in this passage of scripture in Proverbs 2 is it's going to relate the idea of wisdom and it's very going to be speaking very topically but he's going to give you a decision to make with the understanding that there's an effort that you're going to go into this with. And that's the aspect of wisdom that he wants you to mine for. He wants you to put the effort forth. And so if we go to uh, Proverbs chapter number two, verse one, I realize I'm speaking very quickly. This morning, conscientiously, I, I, was, I would find myself rum, rambling about 100 miles an hour. Uh, I blame it on my wife. She handed me a cup of coffee on my way up here. And so I drank the whole thing and I was just, I was ready to go. So uh, I think it's still affecting me. I'm pretty sure. So I'm going to I'm going to try to slow it down. I know, I know I speak too fast, all right? Some people are like, oh, I don't want to offend Pastor if I tell him that he's speaking quickly. I need the reminder, all right? Now, if, if like, you're mean at me, uh, then, then I'll let you know. Stretch it out. Stretch out my words and say less of them, I'm sure, would be helpful. Um, my son was, uh, was misbehaving in the back row this morning, and my brother-in-law told him to, to sit down. And so he moped and went over to my wife and had that face. He's, you know, he's three. And a moment later, when he was done moping, he said, that man was mean at me. And uh, anyways, I'm not going to get upset with you if you tell me I'm going too fast. Just don't cut me off in the middle of the message, okay? That's all I'll ask for. You can remind me from time to time. Um, I, I, I speak to you about at a quarter, a quarter pace of what I think, all right? So I'm just giving you information, and whatever catches up is what will come out sometimes. And so I'm trying, trying to... Put it in perspective. All right. Chapter 2, verse number 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up, sound, uh, he layeth up uh, sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the man, from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. If you look down again to verse number um, 16, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Verse number 21, I'm sorry, verse 20. 
that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this chapter and the wisdom you'd present for us. I'm asking you, Father, that you would help us in our, in our uh, search, our diligent search of your scriptures to know you better, to understand wisdom, to, uh, to be as we ought to be, that our lives truly would continue to be changed. I'm thankful for everyone that's here. I know I need, I need preaching. God, I need it. I'm thankful for times like we had a few weeks ago where we can have a preacher come here and, and preach to us and, and uh, to have that. And I know, likewise, that as I preach uh, here with the individuals, I know I'm part of this audience. I'm asking you to give me wisdom and understanding, Father, of your scriptures, that we would all be able to grow together, learn together. Uh, give me a clarity and that my utterance would be such that it would be understood by our congregation so that we may all grow together. Holy Spirit, please do that work today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a couple things about wisdom, and we'll be going to this idea of mining again. But uh, in wisdom, in this chapter, is very much uh, related to what we find in chapter number one, as we talked about two weeks ago. When we go to wisdom in chapter number one, it's going to have basically the same pattern as you'll find in chapter two. And so there's some warnings, and, and what it's instructing here is this aspect of, of, of the fact that wisdom is something that is God-given. In other words, not something just by your own power that you can figure out. So what should you do in order to be wise? Now, I'll ask you a simple question. Do you want to be wise? How many of you with a raise of hand would say, I want to be wise? Good. How many of you just like, eh, don't care. Don't, doesn't matter to me. All right, no, you'd be foolish to even answer that way, wouldn't you? Uh, normally, if we had some more teenagers in here, there'd be a few. They're like, I don't care, and I believe it. Uh, and so sometimes we would say that kind of thing, and usually we're not trying to avoid wisdom, are we? We, we want to be wise. Uh, another thing is, it's, um, and I, I, this is always my, my comment when people tell me this, People will say to me that uh, some person thinks that they're right. And my point to them will always be, well, we are all right. Now, in other words, we all believe things. We, we believe that we're always right about everything, don't we? Because that's why you believe things. That's, that's how it works. Otherwise, you wouldn't believe it. In other words, none of you are intentionally thinking and believing things that are wrong. Everything you do has a reason for why you've done it or some kind of, maybe it'd be a shallow reasoning, but regardless, it's a reasoning. And it doesn't mean we're always right, by the way. It means that we're right in our own eyes. The Bible describes that about the wisdom in his own, in his, it, by our own conceit. In other words, hey, I'm right because I'm right. And this is the way it is. And so the truth is we're all like that. And to some level of stubbornness, we'll, we will not allow any flexibility in that. Um, as, I, as I get older, I become increasingly more right about the way I believe about things. And then the hope is that it's so founded with scriptures that it's actually correct. Um, but I've also found that I'm more stubborn about a lot of things. And so uh, anyways, my goal with this passage of scripture is that we're able to get to submit our thinking to the idea that God is right about everything and you are absolutely wrong about everything in and of your own power, unless it be guided by the Lord. And so anyways, with this, he's, here's what he's going to start off. In verse number one, he's going to start addressing, uh, for number one, um, is this wisdom that was going to be sought with, with number one, diligence. My son, if thou wilt receive my words. Now, the word receive is kind of a passive thing. It's something that you would get. And what he's explaining to him, to his son, he's saying that this is something that you can get and you can receive the word. And it would be a good thing to receive. I enjoy receiving things. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you guys honored my wife and I with a uh, pastor's appreciation gift. And we, we were honestly, we were, for one thing, we were very surprised. We really were. Uh, we had no idea. Uh, Matt called us up. And, and uh, the, right before that, Matt had said, hey, I got to talk to you about something. I'm like, okay. And so normally when people tell me that ahead of the service, it's not usually a good thing, right? So uh, anyways, what, but he said, did it right here. And anyways, it, it, was, it was a really quick thing afterwards, like just a schedule thing. It wasn't a big deal. But anyways, when, uh, when he called, when he tells me that, and then he says, hey, we've got to talk to you up here. I'm like, well, this, this might not be good. And so, uh, but then he calls my wife. I'm like, okay, my wife's coming up. That's a good thing. So that's usually, once my wife is with me, I know it's a good thing. If anything, we can handle it together. That's, that's the best thing I can gather from that one. Uh, but anyways, that, so we were honored. And you know what? We received something. It was pretty cool. Uh, two years ago, I think, I think it was two years ago, the youth group gave me a bag of cash for my birthday. Do you guys remember that? Uh, it, was, it was pennies, but still, it was still a bag of cash. Uh, by one time, I received a bag of cash from people, and it was it's like $50 in pennies. <laughs> it was a lot of pennies. And so they gave me a job for my birthday of uh, rolling, rolling pennies. And so uh, anyways, the, the point is it, it's, it's fun to receive things. My, my, my brother-in-law being here this past weekend, uh, they came with a whole bunch of stuff that came from, uh, from his son when he was little, but he's 14 now. 
We didn't care about those things. And so we got all sorts of stuff, books and books and books and, and toys and all sorts of stuff. And so we got a lot of stuff at our house now. And it looks like Christmas. I mean, there's just toys everywhere. We've been putting them away. Uh, and it's okay. They're not listening. Um, there's also a lot of stuff going out the, of the house via black bags that go in this magic container that gets emptied out every week. All right. So, um, so we have a lot of this stuff that's happening. Uh, and then they also believe that my brother is Santa Claus, my brother-in-law, uh, because he's starting to get some of that gray in the beard that's coming in. And so... Uh, Anyways, um, in fact, my daughter asked, say, hey, um, can you ask Santa if, uh, if maybe he would give me this for Christmas? And I'm like, he's not Santa. It's like, just ask him anyways. I'm like, okay, I'll ask. And so anyways, um, that's, and they're convinced, they're convinced. So the point is, the point is, we didn't, I didn't say anything. I promise I didn't tell them that, was, that it was Santa. That's just their own conclusions that they came up with. Um, so receive it is nice, but it has the, uh, the context of this is something that you're getting, not by your own power. If you're going to receive, in other words, there's something available, it's been paid for, it's good, and it's going to be given. This is to be received. But as he mentions in this, if thou wilt receive my words, once again, this, this steward of wisdom, this one who is a representative, a spokesman of God's wisdom, uh, so it's not that the, the, the dad is wisdom or that the dad is the source of wisdom, but dad has a responsibility of being a spokesman for God in that wisdom. It's not that dad is infallible, but he's representing that, especially in this chapter as well as chapter number one. And so once again, it's not the commandments of mom and, and, and the law of thy, I'm sorry, commandment of the father and law of thy mother that them personally, but literally as they are spokespersons for the wisdom that God is ordaining. And so in this, he's saying you can receive this and hide my commandments with thee. So here's what he's telling you. There is wisdom that is going out to you, but then you have a responsibility, and that's to hide it. The idea of hiding, guarding it. This is something that we're maintaining and we're holding on to and making sure nothing happens to it. It's not designed for you to hide it and never, never remember where it was at again, to forget about it. For instance, there's been times where I've found money before. Isn't that a great thing? When it's like paying yourself. It's a savings account you didn't know about. And I'll find money like in a pocket or something. And, uh, and, and I, I did that the other day. My wife's like, oh, where did all this money come from? And it took me a long time to figure out where all that money had come from. And so uh, I finally figured out a few days later. I just thought it magically appeared. But regardless, we finally found it. No, it's, it's designed for you to hide it in such a way where it's accessible and it's protected. And so here's what he's telling you how we're going to do this. Verse number two. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom... And apply thy heart to understanding. So what he's instruct, instructing us here is here's the work. It's not just that you're going to hide it. This is the manner in which you're going to take wisdom from God. And you're going to use it. And that has to do with the work that you're going to put into it. He says to incline. Literally that you are bent to listen to what's going on. There's times it's difficult and you're kind of having a struggle to listen to what's going on. There's times I'll be on my phone and, and I've learned this more over time as my children um, are, not, are never as loud as they could be until I'm on the phone. And then suddenly there's just always some kind of emergency that comes up. It could be a two minute conversation. It's a 10 minute conversation. It's always when I'm on the phone. And the same thing with my wife happens every time. It's like we're fighting for attention. And so they just will get loud. And so now I'm listening. There's plenty of background noise and it's an abundance. Uh, and it's remarkable how, how bad it can get. But we're on the phone. We're working hard to listen to what's going on. And he's saying, I want you to incline. The word incline would have the idea that you're leaning in towards. So as somebody's speaking, whether it's a small voice, you're leaning in to try to hear what's going on. This would be that you're listening to somebody that's imparting wisdom and you're at the edge of your seat and you're wanting to hear what's taking place. And so what he's telling you when it comes to wisdom, that should be you. There should be this diligent exertion into receiving this wisdom and being able to hide it in you. And apply thine heart to understanding. In other words, who you are. As a person, you are wanting it to change your life. So this means that we're going to go beyond academic exercise. There's a lot of things that I've learned. Um, and sometimes I'll get caught up uh, with historical things. Like one of my biggest time wasters is history. I love history. I really do. But then sometimes I just find things out about history that, that are completely not important. Uh, for instance, theories on how the heads on Easter Island showed up there. Yeah, all right. You know how much profit there is in, in spending hours to figure out what, what those heads are made of and possibilities and how aliens got them there and all that kind of stuff? None. All right, none. There, there's no profit in that whatsoever. But you know what it costs? Time. 
And th- and, you know, and it can do that. We'll take time, and, and I enjoy learning things, but sometimes I'll just have this time waste where it's not changing. Now, here's what God is pointing out, is that in the meantime, well, there, there's all sorts of things that are competing for your affection, for your time, for, for your learning. There is wisdom that's also being given out by God, and it's being given out freely, by the way, and it's supposed to be hidden, but we're occupied with other things. We're saying, I want you to listen intentionally to wisdom while there's all sorts of stuff going on. And you could be listening to other things, but I want you to zero in on God. And once you zero in on God, notice what he said here in this passage of scripture in verse number uh, two. To apply what? Your heart. Your heart. Who you are. Apply your heart to understanding. So now we're going to do something that this can actually change your life. So that means you can't study the Bible in such a way. You're like, okay, well, that's neat. Or if I figured out this out as well. Or, or now we understand more about the geography. Well, what does this do for you when you get wisdom from God? Sometimes we, we forget about the fact that what God's given us in wisdom can transform you. It can continue to change you. It's going to continue to mold you into the person you ought to be. And we're going to go to that. Uh, there's plenty of pract- practical application of that towards the end of the chapter. But this is what he's instructing you to do. To listen to these teachers of wisdom. Uh, the other part is uh, in verse number three. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth, lifteth up thy voice for understanding. Notice that ends in a semicolon. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for, as, for her as for hid treasure. So two things we're finding in verse number three and four. One has to do with the urgency of crying out. When you're crying out, there's this urgent need that you're, you're pressed for the importance of this understanding. Uh, we, we have, there's a lot of old, old parables um, I think it was Socrates or something like that. Not a theological mind, I promise you. But there's a story about Socrates, and I doubt it's true, but it's just kind of an old proverb, um, that said that when somebody went to him seeking for, uh, for knowledge, the Socrates took him out into the water until they were waist deep, and he pushed him underwater, grabbed him by the shoulders and pushed him underwater. And he said, uh, when he finally left him, let him come up after 30 seconds, he asked him, so what do you desire? He said, knowledge. So he grabbed him by his shoulders again, and he put him under the water, and he held him down. This time is a little longer, around 45 seconds. Finally, let him up. Socrates asked him, what do you want? What do you desire? Knowledge. So he held him down, this time over a minute. Finally, this guy came gasping for air, and he says, what do you want? Air. When you desire air, as Socrates told him, when you desire knowledge as much as you desire air, then you will learn knowledge. Now, that's kind of a silly illustration, and, and again, I'm not trying to hold up Socrates as one we're going to learn our Bible from. But the story is going and explaining something, that sometimes we don't have a desire for the knowledge of God. Not the knowledge of stuff, the knowledge of God, or an understanding, or wisdom, as much as we desire even our own, our own air, our breath, our, our, our food even. The Bible describes it that we would desire God's word more than our necessary food. Is the Bible that important to you? Is the wisdom of God that important? Or are we okay just kind of going day by day by day until we can just figure it all out on our own? And hopefully along the way, God will just help us out enough where he's kind of propped us up a little bit to get there from point A to point B. Because that's kind of how we treat it sometimes. We know that Christ is our friend. And so as long as he's kind of come along for a ride, occasionally he can take the wheel. But otherwise, we're under control and uh, we can get there to the other side. That's not how Christianity works. It should be with the desperation and urgency that we would cry out to God for this wisdom. The whole principle in James chapter 1 that we can ask God for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, what do you lack wisdom in? Everything. Absolutely everything. Even the things you've done day in and day out. Those things you know. You lack wisdom. And if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That's what God wants you to do. And so if that's the case, then we need to make this as an urgent matter from verse number 3. And so verse number 4 then it's going to describe, when it comes to this diligence, uh, we, we understand the act of listening, the urgency. In verse number four, if thou seekest her as silver, and seek, searches for her as for hid treasures, you got to mine for it. It's there, it's present, which is pointing out something. When God gives you this wisdom, it's not necessarily seen immediately. My, my daughter, Lily, likes to do... Uh, like to mine for stuff. We'd gone to Tennessee last year for vacation, and when we were there, we went to some... It wasn't a gem place, because that place was expensive, so we went to another place that uh, goats on the roof. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. So it's a thing down there in Gallenberg. You know what I'm talking about. And so anyways, uh, but they had these cheap buckets of sand. It was like a five-gallon bucket of sand, and you go through, and you kind of mine through it, and you go through this, this slough, which is 
fed by PVC pipes of water. Uh, so it's not even a river or anything. And you get all these stones and they're different colors. And, and you get all this cool stuff. And she loves doing that. It's one of the things that she enjoys is these little hard stones that like you, you have to have like your little pick and your brush and you dig it out and you'll find a special rock or a dinosaur fossil or something made of plastic. But it's in there and she'll do it. And she just loves to, and she finds it and she's whirling work. Now to me, I know a trick about it. If it gets a little bit wet, the whole thing dissolves and is done just like that. But she doesn't want to do that. She wants to scratch away and scratch away and scratch away. And, and I'm just like, just <laughs> break, it's done. It's over in about three seconds. But she's willing to do the work for it. But it's there. So she'll buy. Now, this is such a scam. She'll buy these things. And it's a couple dollars. And we're like, all right, well, you've earned it. And, and maybe it's gifts and people giving you. And, and she'll buy this thing. And it's like a two cent little toy inside some sand that's been pressured together. And, uh, and it makes a mess. It's like gray, chalky sand. And uh, maybe it's even just chalk that's colored. But uh, as she goes through this and she finally gets what she wants out of it, the, the truth is she wanted something, but she was willing to do the work. She knows it's in there, but she's willing to do the work to get into what she wanted. And so what God is pointing out here is something when it comes to this knowledge, this wisdom that God is giving out for you to receive. When you receive it, you're going to have to do something with it. We're going to have to find it in there. And what he's pointing out here is that you have to search for it as for hid treasures. That's the idea of mining, of panning for gold. Whatever it is, you're going in there and you're doing that work. In fact, people today, you can still go back and see where, where people had, and that's where I started with earlier in the, in the illustration at the beginning of the message, having to do with the gold rush and people going out there and trying to find it, is that they would do this work and they would give up many things and they would invest in things. They would spend money so that they can get gold. And at the end of the day, even if they found all of the gold in the world, it's just gold. And God is saying, you have something valuable. You have the wisdom of God. And you have to seek it out. As for hid treasures. In that verse, uh, seekest her as silver and, as, as search, and uh, searches for her as hit, for hid treasures. You have to be willing to mine it and for work for it and try to gain that stuff. And so we have to make a decision then. Here's what he's instructing you to do. With this passage, what he's telling you is you have to make a decision that you're going to work to get wisdom. And notice that he's doing this in the second chapter. In other words, the book of Proverbs is going to have a whole bunch of Proverbs, but he starts off with this rather lengthy introduction that you're going to have to be able to take this stuff and get it. In fact, the Bible even uses things like dark sayings, not, not literally like you have to interpret it based on some kind of Jedi stuff. And what we're saying here is it's very simply understood. You just don't get it immediately unless you do the work to understand what he's talking about. This is talking about study. Listen, are you students of the Bible? Sometimes we feel like, oh, well, Bible scholars, they, they kind of get this. Stuff. Maybe pastors, maybe even a Sunday school teacher, they get it. But me, I, I read it casually and I understand it. Listen, you need to go further than just reading the Bible casually. It, it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful for those of you that read your Bible on a, on a daily basis and you're, you made a commitment to three chapters a day. I knew a guy in college that um, it surprised me, honestly, but, but he told me that he had made a decision when he was 15 years old, and at that time he was 21 years old, and he had not missed one day since he was 15 of reading the Bible three chapters every day since he was 15. I wonder how many of us can say that. That's a six years of, of every single day that he read the Bible three chapters a day every single day. That's wonderful, but are you seeking? Let me put it this way. If... Um, this is kind of embarrassing, but my brother and I used to paint together. My brother Valentino, the, the other preacher, just to let you know the context of who was with me, all right? Uh, and we would go paint, and we'd go paint on a, a nice area of, of um, the county we lived in. And on the way back, we used to always stop at this grocery store called, grocery store called Fresh Time. And uh, at Fresh Time, we would go in, and uh, this is awful, okay? I, just, I feel slightly embarrassed. Some of you have probably done this too, but we'd go and we'd get samples at Fresh Time, all right? And, uh, and it's not just because it was samples. You see Publix and a lot of the other grocery stores gave samples. But Fresh Time gave the good samples. And uh, I remember one occasion I wanted to try the sauces. Like, I'm going to buy some hot wings maybe, maybe. And so um, I go to the deli section, and they had, like, high-end stuff there. And so I want to try this. Like, I want to get some, but there's 20 different kinds of sauces. What kind of, what kind of hot wings do I want? And so she says, well, you can try them. I'm thinking she's going to give me, like, a little bit of sample of the sauces to try out. And she takes a hot wing for every sauce type and gives me one hot wing per sauce. After I've had 10 hot wings, I'm like, I don't know that I want to, I want to buy hot wings anymore. <laughs> but I, I felt obliged to, like, 
or I'll, I'll buy three, <laughs> you know, at the end of it. But we'd go through and they'd have fresh orange juice and it was good orange juice there. I mean, it was really, really good orange juice. Certain times of the year they have fresh watermelon juice and we'd go there all the time. We really did on the way back. Pam, Pam was a really nice lady. She was one of the, the servers there that would give us samples and I got to know her a lot. She knew my kids and it was, that's the kind of relationship we had with the people that were giving away samples, okay? <laughs> we, we had too many of them. But besides the occasion in which we'd get 10, usually we'd get a little piece of, in fact, sometimes they'd give you ribs, like a whole rib. It was, it was amazing. Uh, great place. I miss the place. But um, anyways, the point was uh, we would get those. That was not enough for us to survive on because those occasions in which we'd get a lot, those were good. And it was exciting. Like, look at what we got. We didn't spend a single penny I, besides the effort of going into the grocery store. And yes, we'd buy some groceries, but it wasn't. It was enough to substantiate the value of all those samples. Uh, the, the point is the samples are great, but I still have to do something. I still have to make sure I, I buy food and I take it home and prepare it, don't I? I gotta eat because samples are good, but it's not enough. And much of Christianity is such that we come to church and we walk in and simply by walking into the grocery store, we feel like, oh, well, I'm gonna be fed here. Well, sometimes you will. In fact, sometimes it's really good. And there's sometimes like, well, you know, it was a little sample, it was all right. But it's just a sample. The fullness of your understanding of scriptures does not end with what you hear at church. So think about it. So for the very best things that you've been taught at church and you've received, that's just a sample for what you should be getting. Because God says, I want to give you a whole bunch of wisdom. But what you need to do is you need to take it. And you need to take that little pick and start digging through and start wearing it out. So you can finally find there it is. That's the gem I was looking for. Here's the answer. And God is saying that wisdom is available. But there's a little bit of work you have to do. And it has to be so vital. You have to put that effort, which, by the way, means if you're putting effort, that means you're also putting in the time. You're putting in the resources. You're turning certain things off. TVs are getting shut off. Cell phones are getting shut off. You're closing certain books. You're getting that done so you can seek for that wisdom from God as silver, as hid treasures. That's what you're after. But yet, if I told you there's a million dollars in rubies out in this, in this area, this grass area out there, and we've looked, it's not out there. But if it was, and I told you there was a million dollars in rubies out there, there'd be people outside looking for rubies because it's rubies, hid treasures. But if I told you that those things that can be applied to your heart change your life entirely are available and you just got to do a little bit of mining here or a lot of mining, we neglect that and seek out the rubies. We want everything else. Requires active listening, requires urgency, requires the mining, the work for it. We need more than just a daily reading. We need to be invested in, in uh, the, the wisdom of God. So the point is you want wisdom. You want to get wisdom. In verse number five, by the way, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And so here's what he's saying is you have to work to understand the fear of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say that you can have that you can't have a fear of the Lord until that you just can't understand the fear of the Lord until later on. So when it comes to the fear of the Lord, you are supposed to start with the fear of the Lord, right? That's what it says in chapter number one. But then here he says you can't understand the fear of the Lord until you follow through. An example of that would be, uh, be your kids when they're, when they're wanting to do something, want permission to do something. How frequently do your kids ask an explanation when they're given permission to do something? Hey, Daddy, can I watch this? Sure. Why? Does that happen? Does that ever happen to you? Can I borrow the car? Okay, go ahead. Why? Why, why are you letting me borrow the car? That doesn't happen. You know what does happen? I'd like to borrow the car. Nope. Dad, why? What? Then, then we're like, okay, well, that makes sense. You kind of empathize with them because you did the same thing, right? You question all those. When we don't have, we don't understand. But when submission is provided and then we're able to submit and follow through on that submission, then we can understand. O okay, God, you want us to do this? Okay, I, I don't get it, but God, I'm going to do it. And in your obedience, in your diligence in that, then you will understand that fear of the Lord. And it's a, fall, it's a constant pattern that you're going to see all throughout the book of Proverbs. Uh, so it doesn't end with this, of course. So this is diligence. Okay, so what do, what do we do for, dil for, for, uh, for wisdom? You work really hard so you can get wisdom. Is that, is that it? No, because there's a whole rest of the chapter. Verse number six. For the Lord giveth wisdom, which is what he said back in verse number one, receive. Verse number six. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And so when dad in verse number one says that I will give this, this kid, my son, wisdom, He's pointing out here that this wisdom he's going to give his son 
is according to that wisdom in verse number 6 that came from God himself. See, he's literally he's talking about being a spokesperson for the wisdom of God. Once again, verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. When we diligently seek God, we have to do so also in a matter of dependence, in a, in a manner of dependence, excuse me. You need to be able to depend on God for wisdom. Are you depending on God for wisdom? Oh, I work really hard. Here's what we'll do. We'll separate these ideas. We'll work really, really hard for wisdom, and then I'll get it because I figured out life. Or we're just going to wait on God until God gives me wisdom, and hopefully things work out. He's saying both of those are urgent. They're important. And so we have to remember that God is giving us these things. For the Lord giveth wisdom. So in other words, there needs to be a diligent dependence. A diligent dependence. This is faith. Whenever you go to what God has given us, and we take it, and we start digging in, and we start applying these things, and we start exercising and applying them to our heart, let it change us. And we believe, and we keep trusting in whatever God says, and keep applying these things, then you're going to understand. Knowledge and understanding will come from it. And so he's saying, make this decision to be there. God is the owner of wisdom. You want wisdom from God with God. Fellowship with God is your ability to get wisdom, or is, is where, where you're going to get your ability to get wisdom. To get wisdom is to get God. This is what he's providing for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, to, to do so, what we're talking about is to read, to study, to meditate. And I don't mean like weirdo meditation. No, whatever I remember in, in grade school, I think in, uh, in fifth or sixth grade, we had to sit in, or seventh grade, we had to meditate. Doc, uh, Mr. Pignol which is a, a history teacher. We, we had to learn, you know, we had like half a page on Christianity and history books. I went to public school and then went through like four chapters in Buddhism. And, and so we meditated. Uh, and they, so they had us, this is actually something we did, um, or even like Hinduistic stuff, that we'd sit there and like they taught, like with Hindus, they taught, taught us the yams and how that worked. And we sat and meditated. Uh, that's public school for you. And you're like, oh, that's not that bad. It's bad. All right, it's pagan. And so anyways, that, that's what was happening there. Uh, that's not the meditating he's talking about. Literally to stay focused and to keep thinking on the things of God and the wisdom that he gives us in scriptures. All right, um, the end of chapter, uh, verse number six, uh, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He's going to now give us the benefits. So if, may, if we make the decision of wisdom based on the diligent dependence, what he's saying now is that there's going to be benefits to it. And, and in, in this, he's going to give us two major examples but notice the way he lays this out there. First off, you're going to have knowledge and understanding. But then look at verse 7. He layeth, up, uh, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. The diligent dependers that are applying what God has said. The righteous, you're upstanding, you're right with God. Um, for those of you who are righteous, not, not because you earned your righteousness, you're saved individuals walking uprightly. And if that's the case, he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Now, this seems kind of out of place, by the way, if you're like, wisdom, 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 work hard, work hard, he's a buckler. But it seems to be out of place, except for the fact what he's explaining then is if you go through the wisdom of God, he says that I'll be the one that sustains you, which makes perfect sense. Because what he's saying is we can go through life and thinking, okay, I'm going to figure it out. This is the safest way. And there are certain things like, I, yeah, we don't go there. We don't eat that. Don't touch that. Uh, my son, which I know I, I talk a lot about him. Because he's, the, he's the most adventurous one these days. But uh, he'll find things. We, we find things on the ground, and we don't know what it is. We find brown stuff on the ground. Well, you can imagine, okay? So we just, we're not sure. We have no idea. We're just, it could be chocolate, or it might not be. It could be something else, right? It could be mud, um, or the stuff that's around, all right? So, um, so what happens is that, that changes the course of the day sometimes. Um, our, things that are used for our work. It can be a varying medium right, as far as what they're going to use. So, and I won't, I won't go too much into stories with that, but there's plenty of them. And anyways, uh, when we go through these things, um, I, I found that like, okay, the rule is if you find it on the ground, don't eat it. All right, that's, that's, that's just true regardless. Um, my son will come in, like he'll be in the car and our car is clean, seemingly, and then he comes in and he's chewing on something. And like, what are, you, what are you chewing on? Starburst. I'm like, I didn't give you a Starburst. We haven't ha I haven't bought a Starburst in like years. I, I don't, when in the world did you get a Starburst? It says in the car. I'm like, that, that wasn't a Starburst, man. I have no idea what you're eating in there. But he'll find it. And I'm realizing something. We have rules of wisdom. These are, these are things you shouldn't do. But if he would listen to me, sometimes we found that like, that's not what he thinks it is. And it's safer to just simply obey. Now, in this, he's pointing out something. When you follow God's wisdom, it's safer. There, there's a benefit to depending on God and his wisdom. 
There are times it doesn't make sense. For instance, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians in the morning, and we're going to talk about giving. And when the Bible talks about giving, you know what? Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. I'm struggling with finances, and in fact, he's addressing people that a lot of them are struggling with finances. And then he's going to address some parts where he says, all right, I want you to give. And I want you to give to the work of the gospel and, and give to the ministry. I want you to do these things. Like, wait a second. Wouldn't I do financially better if I just kept it in my pockets? That sounds better to me. Can I just choose wiser in a wiser way how to do this? Well, he gives instruction as far as how to do these things. And we just trust God and his wisdom for how it should go about. We just simply have to believe him. And there are certain times when I think, well, for instance, uh, the solution this morning from chapter number 7 of 1 Corinthians. Well, the solution is absolutely anything available when God says the solution was marriage. We trust God for his solutions. In other words, when you trust him in his wisdom, apply those things. He'll be your buckler. He'll be your shield. He will hold you up in such a way that he will protect you. He will be that shield for you against whatever may come. Even the wisdom of this whole world, he'll protect you from it. And so we need to be able to enjoy the benefits from God. He is the buckler. His wisdom is his protection. He's good for your soul. He will protect you in a couple of ways. He's going to guard you from crooked men and from immoral women. If you go to verse number nine, thou shalt then understand. I'm sorry, verse number, uh, verse number eight. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. In other words, another reference to the path there. Very similar to what we find in chapter number one uh, as far as what we are supposed to do and, and not do. Excuse me, verse number nine, if you will. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Uh, you'll notice with this that the wisdom is not a matter of smart and dumb or, or, um, or, or just good and bad or better and best. He's talking about godly versus ungodly, moral versus wicked. And there's an aspect in where now we're going to understand right and wrong. But the other aspect about it, according to verse number nine, there's a social benefit to this as well. Can I say um, for Christians, we ought not to be weirdos based on being Christians. Now, if the world perceives us as weirdos, that's fine. But one of the things that we do in Christianity is we create people that cannot function in society. We don't know how to talk to people. We're not sure how to deal with our finances with the world and, and people can take advantage of us. That, that shouldn't be Christians. Christian, what he's saying is, I've got wisdom for you. You, 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 have, you have a way to handle this. You're going to have a way to survive. You're going to have a way to take care of your health even. He's got the answers for you. He's got it all. But we don't seek God for it. And now we're socially inept and incapable of doing what we need to. We have, we have no idea how to make a friendship. We have no idea how to approach a non-believer with the gospel. We have no clue, even though it gives us the answers for all of that here in the scriptures. He provides all the answers, but unfortunately we don't follow him. And there's no question there's a social benefit. He addresses that in that verse about uh, righteousness, judgment, and equity. Every good path he's talking about. These are all things that are social. These are all things with other people. In verse 10, it says, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of up, uprightness, who walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman. So first off, we'll talk about the, uh, the crooked man. Now, he's talking about those people that would, that would cause you harm. These are wicked people. In fact, um, talks about the way of the wicked in chapter one, similar past. A passage here when he's addressing the ways of the crooked people. These are the ones that are not going down the path that God wants them to go. These are people that would be destruction, uh, destruct, destructful. Yes, destructive, destructive. Thank you. I appreciate. It. I know. My, I know some words here. All right. So uh, the point is that um, that God is the guardian. In verse number seven, eight, that that God is the guardian, the protector. Verse number eleven, twelve. He's addressing that wisdom is that guardian, that protector, because of course wisdom is of God. And so what, the, what he's providing here is a direction for you to be able to take based on the wisdom of God. You need to understand the wisdom of God to know it. Uh, furthermore, uh, there are those that are going to try to do evil. He's saying, I've set you up in such a way you don't have to fall. But you have to make a decision. You're going to hunt for this wisdom versus the wisdom of man. Secondly, there's the part, and by the way, I know that we're kind of glossing through the section, but chapter 5 and 6 is going to address it a lot more, so we'll, we'll spend more time there. But in uh, verse number 16, it's going to start talking about the, the strange woman. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. It's interesting that she uses smooth words. 
It does not address her appearance. Sometimes we feel like, oh, well, with, with her appearance, well, it's with smooth words. Um, that will be discussed in length in chapter 5 and 7, excuse me, not 5 and 6. But, um, but an immorality will, will tempt often a man with, uh, with flattery or with, uh, uh, with this temptation of, of his ego, right? This is something that's taking place. Verse 17, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. She's disloyal. She forsakes her husband and forgets her God. He's saying, I will protect you from that one that would do so. Verse 19, uh, sorry, verse 18, for her house inclineth unto death and her path unto the dead. What he's talking about here is the fact that it's, it is destruction, going that route. And what he's telling you here is that there is an option. There is a path of wisdom or there is a path of destruction. The crooked man would be such that would take you down, that would destroy you and take you with him. It's destroying himself likewise. The woman likewise would end up in such a way that your life would be destroyed. It's interesting that when it comes to the, the direction that people will follow, when it comes to evil things and forsaking the laws of God, that oftentimes it ends specifically with immorality. And so he's, he's addressing the young person in regards to this, that you can fall into this. And of course, it's not just young people, but people of really any age that can fall into this. Uh, these paths of death, naturally, these are destruction. There's hopelessness. There's no way out of these things. And God says, I can spare you from these things. Follow me. You won't go down these paths. So with this, he, um, he reiterates his choice. Go down to verse number 19. None that go unto her uh, return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. You notice with this, it does reference the crooked man. It re references the, the, um, the, the strange woman. But it doesn't give a lot of specifics. And here's what he's done for you. He's given you a choice and he's demonstrated there's benefits of protection in this. But if you don't make the choice of wisdom... That you're going to pursue this. That you're going to try to seek it out and find as much as you can in it. In regards to his wisdom and apply them to your heart. Then if you refuse that, you're not going to experience the benefits. And you'll go down these paths that are not good paths for you. Paths that end in destruction. In a literal physical death even. As far as what would take place. For an unsafe person, this would be paths uh, unto hell specifically. And then they would go down that way. Which is amazing to me because we can spare our children even from going these paths that would lead them into a eternal destruction that they would never even get saved because they're so drawn in by these sinful lusts that they would reject Christ himself based on their desire to do something else. And so with, with that, he's saying, hey, we can spare people from this, but we have to give them this right instruction. Now, once again, this is not meaning that if you're saved that you can lose your salvation, you'll go down this path. That's not what he's suggesting. And nor can you earn this path of life where you do good things and now you can go to heaven because of it. That's not what he's suggesting here. He's literally talking about the destruction of the individual. I've seen saved people do some awful things that have ended in their life being ended. That, that was done. Um, and, and just simply because they did the wrong thing. So here's what he's pointing out. Chapter number two is study the Bible and get as much wisdom as you can out of it and make a decision to do so. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of people are against decisional Christianity. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there's a lot of writing done on it and that they say that you shouldn't be prompting people. Preachers shouldn't be prompting people to make decisions. In fact, I saw a big article about that uh, by an independent Baptist, by the way, or one that calls himself an independent Baptist, that uh, we shouldn't be trying to get people to make decisions. It's something that should just kind of like slowly happen in their lives. And that Jesus never tried to get people to make decisions. So I'm like, have you not read any message in the Bible when there's messages like repent and there's messages throughout the scriptures that are saying that they need to change and turn away from certain things. And there's some messages that are simply saying get saved. I mean, they're constantly the whole point is make a decision. And here's the simple decision. Choose to study the Bible in a deeper way, in a stronger way than you ever have. Why? Because the, to not do so is destruction for you. And that's not worth it. And so, when he's going to give us the rest of the Proverbs, he's going to give us some things that are, that, that are deep, but at the same time, incredibly practical. And I love the book of Proverbs because he's going to give you some things that this is just what you do with it. The next chapter is going to emphasize on the blessings of wisdom, by the way, primarily. Um, and then we get to a lot of the things that we're supposed to do to, to get it. And so anyways, it's an incredible passage, of script, incredible passage of scripture. He comes with a choice, a benefit, and a warning. And then the deciding factors in verses 19 through 20, 22 is just the contrast between yes and no. So what decision will you make today? A path of wisdom 
or a path of, of foolishness, of being simple and forsaking all those things, and that's where your destruction will come. Uh, and by the way, by the way, we'll get to this most, mostly in Proverbs chapter 9, but when it comes to making a decision or not making a decision, the Bible would call you a simple person, that you will not have the understanding, you will reject those things. You might say, well, if I don't know, what you don't know can't hurt you. You ever heard that phrase? How many of you know that's not true by experience? Right? I've had a lot of things I didn't know, like when there's something in the road and I don't see it. That, that's, that hurt to me. Right? It's painful. And so, yes, we understand that's what, something that happens. So you have to make a decision. So let me encourage you, make a decision. Study your Bible. Open it up. Get to know it. Try to find out. You're trying to figure out what the next decision is for you. God says, I've got an answer for you. And I'm giving it to you. But here's what you got to do. Open it up and start reading, making decisions based on applying to your heart. This is standing fast on what God wants me to do. All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads. We'll have uh, time for a comfort invitation. Lord, thank you for the opportunity you gave us this evening to be able to look at your word. I pray our, our church would choose to be wise and not fools, that we would avoid being the simple, we would avoid being the ignorant. I pray you would help us in the decisions we make, God, that our church would choose to be students, scholars even of the Bible, in the sense that we are making it about your word and uh, we are knowing it so well, Father, that we can apply all those things to our hearts. So that, way we, that way we may be able to walk with you. We thank you, God, for this time. We love you. We're, we praise you. We rejoice in you for what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet.